it's times like this when the power and the value of the STEM learning ecosystems community of practice becomes very visible. Presented by STEM at Home, an initiative launched by the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice, STEM Community Conversations is a series of conversations for teachers, school officials, community leaders, and many others impacted by school closures and virtual learning. For those of you new to this initiative, the STEM Ecosystems, operated by TIES, which you can find at stemecosystems.org, harness the power of business and industry, funders and foundations, K-12 schools, higher education, and more to find solutions to common problems and to build thriving communities. Embracing the ecosystem way, these gatherings have provided and will provide a space and time for leaders to share common challenges, ideas, and resources. Conversations will revolve around successful models and new ideas to support STEM learning experiences during and beyond this time of social distancing. These are interactive conversations where you will have the opportunity to ask your questions to our experts. So make sure you enter your questions by clicking the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, where you can also upvote the questions asked by others. My name is Jeremy Shore, and thank you for joining us today for a conversation as we explore the close connection between education and work by hearing from leaders who are building the STEM pipeline in a post-COVID-19 world. If you wouldn't mind, please let us know your name, location, and organization in the chat, and feel free to have side conversations in there, and some of our panelists, myself, other ecosystem uh, leaders might be in there uh, answering questions and engaging as well. I know I have a lot of questions for our speakers, and we'll get to those in a couple of minutes, but I know that you will as well. So again, please be sure to use that Q&A button at the bottom to both to ask your questions and to vote on the other questions you see. Even if you don't have specific questions, it's really important that you look through the questions that others have asked and vote them up so we can see which questions are resonating with you. We'll be asking some of you to ask your questions live on air, and we unfortunately will not get to every question. So the earlier you get those in, the more votes that happen, the more likely it is that we'll be able to get to those questions. I'm so happy today to be joined by three uh, really, really impressive panelists. And the first is Dr. Joe Dragon, Senior Executive Officer, Capital Region, uh, BOCES. Uh, Dr. Dragon received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the College of St. Rose and the University of Albany. He currently serves as the Senior Executive Officer at Capital Region and has led uh, programs with partners in business, industry, and higher education to fuel the workforce pipeline in manufacturing, entertainment technologies, which is cool, engineering technologies, telecommunications, health careers, information technology, and construction trades, including the launch of a new K-12 and adult workforce training program. A gubernatorial appointee to the Capital Region Economic Development Council, uh, Joe serves on the executive committee and co-chairs the Workforce and Education Work Group, a former Work Creek member on workforce development and education for, Obama, for the Obama administration's Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Initiative. In 2018, Dr. Dragone served on the White House State Federal STEM Summit under the Trump administration. He received the 2014 American Graduate Champion Award from w, uh, WMHT yeah, and is a founding member of the Empire State STEM Learning Network. He is recognized on the 2020 City and State Education Power 100 list. Uh, so Joe, I know that, that all of us here, I think everyone listening, everyone talking, we all agree that the main purpose of STEM is to just crush the arts and eliminate them from schools in general, right? I, I assume you agree with that? Absolutely, that's always been the goal. That's been the goal since day one, make sure no one ever has an arts and humanities experience ever again uh, at all costs. So. Um, in, in all seriousness, and thank you, Jeremy, and, uh, and, and welcome, everyone. It, it's great to be here. It's great to be with Ties, and they're such good partners in the work that we do here in the Capital Region. Um, uh, personally, my background, ironically enough, is in music and music education. Um, my undergraduate and a master's degree is in music. I spent time as a music teacher. I spent a lot of my career um, as an educator. There is also a professional musician, so a real lot of opportunities to understand all of these relationships. And when it comes to STEM, it's so important to understand and you know, well, it's not STEM, it's STEAM. It's not STEAM, it's STREAM. It's not STEM, it's STEM with two M's because the second M is medicine and you can go on and on and on. And unfortunately the forest gets lost from the trees sometimes. And it's this interdisciplinary relationship that's so important. And, and in Jeremy's introduction mentioned entertainment technologies, which is a, a, a great program that we run here in collaboration with our local community college. And it's about the opportunities for kids to experience arts through the type of learning that STEM supports, where they work on Broadway shows, they, ought, they, they, they tech local shows, they're doing sound, they're doing lights, they're doing stagecraft, they're doing and experiencing what STEM really is, and it's that strong interdisciplinary nature of all of those things working together. So um, I guess by means of introduction, understanding the holistic approach 
that we take here in the capital region with regards to STEM and how that can look and how it touches everyone and how important it is for the hub to make sure that we touch everyone, I think is a, is a real good ground floor as we get things rolling, Jeremy. Thank you. You know, one of the things that uh, people have heard me talk about a lot, but I say it a lot because I think it's important, is that um, uh, my brother's a firefighter. My older sister works in marketing and editing. My little sister scuba dives with sharks for a living um, at an aquarium. Um, and all of them, and, and then me, obviously, in this work, um, use STEM. If we're talking about STEM pipelines, it's not, it is about the science jobs. It is about the engineering jobs and the computer science jobs, but it's not only about those jobs. There are transferable skills that are valuable to, to really every career path. And that's really the, the belief of the ecosystems and something that we try to focus on a lot. Uh, next up, we have Jill Lansing, assistant, assistant vice chancellor for the education pipeline steward, uh, Empire State STEM Learning Network. Jill is the Assistant Vice Chancellor. Uh, she provides leadership on initiatives to strengthen the alignment between pre-K-12 and higher education and to help more students succeed in college and the workforce. She serves on the leadership committee of the Empire State STEM Learning Network, a statewide collaborative of educators and business and industry partners working together to advance STEM teaching and learning. She led the SUNY STEM Mentors Project, project made possible by the National Science Foundation and Vettel and the Army Education Outreach Program, where SUNY students in STEM disciplines mentor, uh, mentor middle and high school students and help them to develop scientific skills. Jill is also working with educators and industry leaders across the state to advance strategies to address the middle level skills gap and support New York's future workforce. So uh, Jill, as I just mentioned, I'm a big believer that STEM skills are useful in a whole lot of areas beyond the typical scientist and engineering pathways. So what can you tell us about the work that you did for the Army? Sure. Thanks so much, Jeremy. And thank you, Ties. And also thank you to the STEM ecosystems for having us today. It's really a privilege to be with you. Um, I was thinking a little bit about the webinar before we got started. And um, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was the opportunity to be a part of the leadership committee for the Empire State STEM Learning Network, which is a collaborative made up of educators and business leaders, as well as our nonprofit organizations, cultural institutions, and community uh, groups to support uh, the future of STEM teaching and learning. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here today with uh, my colleague, Dr. Dragoni, and also uh, Dr. Purcell to talk about um, you know, what is possible in STEM and really how we can make the right connections um, to build the future. And then I, I think um, I saw some of my other colleagues on here um, from the state networks across, across the state. So we have um, people on from Capital Region, Finger Lake, Central New York, Southern Tier, Long Island, and others who have all um, been such great advocates and leaders in STEM education. Um, and one of the things we've been able to do is to really um, create new pathways and to develop partnerships that are really essential uh, for the future of STEM and STEM education. And um, one of the things that we did was we partnered with the Army Education uh, Outreach Program and the TEL as well as um, the National Science Foundation to pair our graduate students up with um, middle school students to help them to develop um, science literacy skills and skills that really help them, as you said, Jeremy, in all aspects of their life, from developing hypotheses um, to actually carrying out a research experiment and then drawing conclusions, analyzing data, and you know, really to become a, a leader in STEM. So just a really great opportunity to match up those uh, graduate students with our uh, middle school students and help them to become future scientists. So thanks so much for the question. That's very cool. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe we dig a little bit more into some of these specific programs that uh, the two of you, and I'm sure Lisa will be talking about. Um, there's a, a lot of very um, exciting opportunities, I think, for all of our ecosystems um, to really be thinking about pipelines in, in a little bit different way than I think maybe we mm -hmm. traditionally have. Uh, so finally, uh, last but not least, we have Lisa Purcell, PhD, Clinical Sciences, Immun Immunology and Inflammation, Scientific Director, Secondary Education Programs at Regeneron. Uh, Lisa joined Regeneron in 2008 and is a clinical scientist. Uh, she received her PhD from McGill University and completed her postdoctorate training at Columbia. Uh, Dr. Purcell, along with her team, oversee the clinical development of therapies with the immunology and infectious disease therapeutic areas, including those for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. She also developed therapies for pathogens using Regeneron's novel technologies to translate science to medicine. Dr. Purcell is actively involved in Regeneron science education efforts, including the Regeneron Science Talent Search, research mentorship efforts, the International and Westchester Science and Engineering Fair, and STEM teacher programs. She develops the science curriculum for the high school research mentorship and STEM teacher fellowship, and has mentored many students from all of Regeneron science education programs. 
So Lisa, um, my, uh, I got a couple things I want to ask you, frankly, um, but I'm going to just pick one of them. And that's um, from our conversation earlier. So my graduating class was only 105 people, which I thought was very, very small. Uh, <laughs> but apparently uh, compared to yours, that's, uh, that's like, uh, you know, New York uh, or, uh, you know, Manhattan. Um, how did you get exposed in such a small graduate class, such a small school, um, where I understand your parents were, were you know, teachers, uh, administrators, how did you get exposed to the idea of becoming a scientist? Because I, I think that's one of the things that we talk about a lot is kind of these little pockets of, of rural and or impoverished students and how we can even make them understand that, that science careers are an option. So how did that happen for you? Yeah, it's a really good question, Jeremy. Thanks um, to everyone uh, on the panel and also for the invitation to be here. Um, <clears throat> so like, like you mentioned, I, I graduated with 38 students. Um, I had both my parents as teachers. My dad was my principal. My mom was my grade eight health teacher. Uh, yeah, um, she was my gym teacher in grade nine. I didn't, I, when I was in, in grade 10, and obviously I, I'm you know, Canadian, I grew up in a, a really small town. I did notice there was somebody on from BC, so hello. Um, I, I, I had this uh, science teacher and he taught us in a different way. So I think for every scientist, no matter what that science is, and we talked already about different um, science jobs and how they're influenced, I think we can always go back to a teacher right? We always go back to this one teacher that inspired us in some way that lit a spark. And uh, my teacher was Mr. Perry. So he was my grade 10 biology teacher. And um, I got interested in biology. I got interested in studying biology. I went to university, a really small uh, university in Canada, um, and did my undergrad. And it was there that I learned you can be a scientist as a job. Like you can do research as a job. Um, I didn't know what a PhD was growing up. I didn't know, you know, what that was. I didn't know that you could do research, you know, and, and, and get some sort of degree in something very specialized. Um, and so one of the, the objectives that I've had in coming into the role of some of the um, I guess scientific outreach activities that we do at Regeneron, which, which are many, um, including, you know, some of these big competitions like Regeneron STS and, and ISEF now, because Regeneron now is the, the title sponsor for ISEF. Um, but one of the things that I really it, it is, is at my core it, it is, is how to get those rural kids engaged and also how to have them exposed to the different types of STEM jobs. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think in the last couple months with, with COVID-19 and us having to do a lot of our things remotely, we've all realized that we can do a lot of the science, whether it's more traditional or what have you, in a remote fashion. And, and there, as long as you know, those rural communities have an internet connection, um, and I realize that for some that that's, that's also an issue. I mean, where I come from, we lose internet when the wind blows, and I'm not joking when I say that. Um, I think that, you know, realizing that we can do this type of outreach um, in, a, in a more effective manner using technology um, and, and trying to figure out how to do that uh, moving forward is, is something that we really need to explore for rural communities. Yeah, and, and you're right. They, uh, we talk a lot in the ecosystems about this, um, about the access issue. And, and um, I think a lot of people in the ecosystems believe that um, now's kind of the, the time that we can start to address that. Um, the plus to that being, of course, um, that the more stable and high-speed access we have to places in the world, the more collaboration uh, that can happen in a lot of these areas. Um, so I want to uh, start off, before we start going to, to audience questions, um, I want to start off by just kind of learning a little more about the, the very specific work that each of you is doing as it relates to um, working and thinking about the pipeline in this in this pandemic world that that we have right now. Um, so, Joe, I'd like to to start with you. the The work that you're doing, um, how has it? So, first of all, I, I'd love if you could just kind of give us a, a very high level overview of the pipeline work you're already doing, but specifically to talk about how it's needed to shift um, in order to to keep on trucking, keep on going um, with everybody in their homes. That, that, thank you, Jeremy. And to, to say, 
it hasn't been a challenge would be a huge lie. And, and I think it's because we've always come from a frame that um, the, the training and the connections and the work that has always occurred has only happened really in, in, in one way or, rare, or at least very limited in the way that it's always been approached. And, and this has obviously forced it to, to, to play a different hand and to think about how the work can go on differently. You know? So I have, I have a couple hats in my, in my day job, for lack of a better word, I coordinate regional career and technical education programming, early college, high school work, and those kinds of things for our, for our four county regions, serves about 83,000 students. So we have over 300 partners in mostly in business and higher education along nine career clusters and 45 programs or so that do all this training. And, and it's a, this huge scope from tech, um, traditional technical training um, to what we have a lot now with our, we have a huge video game design program. We have an entertainment tech program. Uh, we have an engineering tech program serving the semiconductor manufacturing needs that we have in our region. So we, we have a real long, broad base of the different training that we do. And the second part of what I do in my other day job is, is to help coordinate the, the STEM hub. And our focus has really been on the touch point. So in, in a weird way, refocusing this work has just continued to converge these things. So over here, we're talking about training and how we can continue to build our pipeline. And over here, almost in a silo, was how do we continue to make more connections with workforce industry and opportunities to understand what careers and the pipelines are. And what we've seen, I think, as a result of, of the circumstances that have been ongoing is just these have really converged a little bit more. So as an unintended consequence to a degree is our work has become that much more deliberate and, and creative, frankly, about how we can um, avail so many more people through the ecosystem, the work and the opportunity that there are for STEM careers. So um, at least for my chair, the connectivity has been stronger um, and that's work that we're continuing to build out where it used to be, how do we continue to provide site visits? The work that's going on now is how do we continue to, to build a library or resources that people can access anytime to learn about any company and learn about any career. And, and I don't think we would have ever thought about that approach until it became much more necessary like it is now. So the whole flipping of how do we get kids to a business and see what's going on versus how do we take three minute, four minute videos and interviews with folks in different business and different industries, bring them not only to students and help them learn about STEM careers, but have access to guidance counselors, access to teachers, access to families so they understand about what all those opportunities look like. So this, this silver lining, I think, is this is really a focus on greater resources to provide more access to everyone to understand about what the STEM pipeline, the STEM career, and the STEM opportunities are throughout our region. Thank you. So, so Jill, um, Joe's kind of talking about this this transition from from in person to virtual. I I would imagine that um, the pipeline work that you're doing is is having similar conversations. Um, so I'd I'd like to hear about that. But but specifically, I'm curious about um, what the the benefits are, um, and therefore, if a if a vaccine is discovered tomorrow and vetted by the you know end of June, and this all goes away, what components of the the shift in thinking do you think will stick around, even if we go back to to totally normal? Well, thanks, Jeremy. I, I think um, your question is, is excellent because um, about two weeks ago, I convened um, the Empire State STEM Learning Network uh, regional hubs from across the state. And, um, you know, really just trying to say, like, what can we do to be helpful? And, you know, how can we support an advance or future? And I, when I first, you know, I, I called them, I didn't really know what to expect because um, we have been, you know, really, really battling um, this virus um, in New York State, like, you know, like none other. And I, I know we share that um with the rest of our, our states in the nation and our colleagues um but we are one of our partners is um northwell health and northwell health is the largest private employer in new york state and also one of our largest hospital and healthcare systems and literally for them it came down to saving lives i mean it, it was it was it was a life and death matter um so i just didn't know what was going to happen with you know stem programming in this time even though in my mind and i, I know the mind of all of our leaders stem was more important than ever 
Um, but at the same time, you know, we were literally, our some of our partners were saving lives, um, you know, just really trying to um, get the healthcare um, needs into the community and try to, you know, save people from, from um, the impact of the virus. So we have been learning a lot in, in that regard. But when I, when I actually got them together, what I heard was they were just doubling down. Um, our leaders, Donna DiCiato and um, Mary Margaret Small and uh, Mark Vaughn, they, they were in uh, Michelle Cabot, Western New York, they were just saying, you know, first of all, we're stopping everything to make PPE gear and do what we need to do to, to support our regional communities. But then Joe Marinelli in the Finger Lakes was leading um, a conversation on the next generation STEM standards in New York. And so it, it was just, it just kept going. And I think that they were realizing too, and their community leaders were realizing that without STEM, you know, we really don't have a future. That, you know, the things that Regeneron are doing is just, you know, incredible and so needed right now. Um, so we need to really prepare the future researchers and scientists um, for these challenges. Um, so just a couple of things um, at SUNY, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is even more than before, strengthen the connections between K-12 higher education and the workforce. One of our major partners, um, King & King Architect in Central New York, they actually provided a tour virtually for the Pine Grove Middle School to see what a different learning environment could look like. And our partners at Siemens are coming to us and saying, you know, like, as we think about the future, you know, how can we um, reinvent and reimagine the higher education space? Um, so that it's safe, uh, physically safe, as well as, you know, providing learning opportunities virtually as well as in person. So those are kind of things that I think that we've been um, introduced to. And I'll just tell you, people are working, I mean, there's a new definition of above and beyond. And the thoughtfulness and, you know, thinking forward and leading forward has just been phenomenal here in New York. Yeah, I, I the, you know, I, um, I, I keep saying this, and I keep feeling guilty saying it, I think that, um, there are some positives coming out of this. I feel guilty saying it because anytime we were talking about people dying, I don't wanna be talking about positives. Um, but it is really nice to see how people are coming together and solving really novel problems in very fast um, mm -hmm. and efficient ways. Um, Lisa, you were, you were talking about how um, you know, science, meta, uh, you know, development, all of those things are kind of happening in these new and remote ways. I'm curious from a, from a business perspective, from a, an industry perspective, um, where do you think the balance is? Again, we go back to, to kind of normal world, if we ever do. Where do you think the balance is where the benefits of remote and the benefits of in-person, where, where do you think that'll all sit when this shakes out? Oh, that's a, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Uh, I won't hold you to your answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I, I was, as Jill was talking a little bit there, I was thinking about Regeneron. So, um, I'm one of the study directors, so we have, as you've heard in the news, a, a, a bunch of, of clinical studies ongoing for COVID-19, um, and so our teams have been working nonstop, uh, number one, to develop an new antibodies, but also um, to use some of our existing therapies in the context of this disease. Um, and so we adapted, so to give you a context, when you start a clinical trial, usually it takes, you know, a year and a half to two years to get it up and, and going, to design a protocol to get everybody in, in you know, into to what's going on operationally, to enroll sites. Um, our team came together in eight days from the time that we sat in the boardroom and said, hey, we're going to start this clinical trial to the first patient that received a dose. So it was really all hands on deck. And we did this all remote, right? So we interacted with sites remotely. We, we did that sort of thing. And then when you think about, you know, it, bringing this back to STEM and our STEM initiatives, um, we, I went back to my team. So for example, we have a, a high school mentorship program and there, you know, it's a pretty competitive program. We only take on about 10 students per year. They stay for a couple of years, but they do research on site. So we went back to our team. We went back to the mentors and we're like, okay, well, you know, we can't, we can't bring high school students on site. We're not on site. How do, how do we do, how do we run some of these programs which are traditionally run in a laboratory setting so that you can learn how to do traditional science? Um, and uh, what we decided to do was to get all the mentors to come together and like Jill and, and Joe were, were talking about, everybody sort of came together. We're, we're like, okay, we can't cancel this program. You know, these high school students, they have to learn science. They have to learn, you know, 
rigor science. They have to really understand how, how science works, how you come up with a hypothesis or a question and you run that through. Um, and so uh, it was really interesting in how the mentors came together and from, you know, within a month, we designed a program that was completely different from what we had before, completely remote. And so what we were, what we were doing in these discussions, what we were learning, you know, what are the things that our students are lacking when they're coming in that we need to fill that gap? And it were things that we were identifying things that weren't, we weren't quite addressing in our previous programs. And so I think moving forward, it's not clear to me what this is all going to look like, but what's clear to me is that we can adapt and we're resilient and we can come up with ways in order for everyone to understand STEM, STEM initiatives and how to sort of move forward in whatever that sort of science job looks like um, in whatever, you know, whatever sort of, place that you're that you're working at this point so it's, it was it's kind of interesting so I, I didn't answer your question i didn't do that on purpose but uh, i didn't answer your question but i i think it's just evolving and i think it's going to be very different moving forward than it was Listen, Lisa, I, I think it's evolving is probably um as good an answer as as anybody's going to give and you know i that sort of leads me to to kind of a backwards follow-up a follow before a follow follow down. I don't know what a question of the opposite of a follow-up is. Um, so before all this started, um, I think that we all in this country, you know, we knew we had issues. We knew we had some um, communications issues. Not everybody thought that there was an access issue, but, but people did. Their organizations were working towards it. We were fairly secure in backup plans for work and for school and all of those things. Um, then this happened and it turned out that we were not prepared in all sorts of areas, that the access equity issue was much, much bigger than we thought, that, um, um, you know, that, that the pipelines for development of medicines were not necessarily what they need to be to address rapid shifts, uh, that workplaces weren't ready for this. So there, there, there's not you know, a, a enough ingenuity, people being proactive um, in all these different fields. Um, why do you think that we're in that place in, or we were in that place um, in this country? And do you think that we're going to um, be better prepared next time if it's a few years down the line? I want to say yes, but the, I guess, realist scientist in me, um, let me give you an example. April, 2018, I, uh, went up in front of our senior management, we had some government contracts and said, look, we need to develop broad coronavirus antibodies because it's not a matter of if we'll have another coronavirus outbreak, it's a matter of when. So I went back to those slides, right? Because, you know, it's, it, this is not, and this is not something that like, I'm not, you know, an all seer. This is, this, this, just based on the science, we knew we were gonna have another coronavirus outbreak. We didn't know when, but these viruses are really smart. They know how to outsmart um, our immune system. And, and there's lots of crosstalk between animal and, and, and crossover into humans. So I hope, as a scientist that we're more prepared moving forward, we can you know, invest not only in the STEM pipelines, but also in the science and also have more uh, voices at the table to uh, encourage at least you know, our governments to invest in some of these therapies where we know that there is a, you know, a good chance that something new is gonna, gonna, um, gonna emerge. Um, but the, I guess I'm a little bit cynical because every scientist has seen this. We, we all have seen it. We all, you know, the Ebola, or Ebola therapies were worked on for, you know, 25 years before we had um, the two outbreaks that we did um, a few years ago. Um, but nobody paid attention. So I'm hoping that people are, this will be at the forefront of people's minds, you know, the last gigantic uh, outbreak that we had was in 1918 in, in Spanish, in terms of Spanish flu, and, and nobody remembers what that was like, and, and everybody just thinks that it's, you know, the flu. Well, now, you know, at least this will be at the forefront of people's brains and, and perhaps would encourage some 
you know, funding and thoughts around, um, you know, in, in the concept of, of, of pathogens and emerging path pathogens and addressing them. But yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Um, Joe, wh what about from, uh, you know, your, your industry partners and, and things? Um, what's a preparedness level do you think going to be moving forward? And what should schools be thinking about um, to prepare students not only to learn remotely, but to work in careers remotely? Yeah, there's a, there's a few pieces to it, I think, I think Jeremy, and, and, and it certainly is, you alluded to, the, the circumstances have been driving a lot of the thinking. And I think one, one is a, is, a, is a policy matter, and that's what we've been really dealing with in New York, because since March, candidly, all the policy's been suspended and, and, and terms of, in terms of how we need to, as schools, operate. You know, it used to be, you know, your, your butt had to be in the seat X amount of minutes or you didn't get credit. You had to be in school 180 days, you didn't get credit. You had to do A, you didn't get B. You had to do C, you didn't get D. And candidly, that's all been waived. So what we're seeing is innovation kind of growing around that. And hopefully, which we think it, on the plus side of a longer term play is some realization on the policy lens or the policy side of the K-12 work, especially with the secondary students who can really work and learn and thrive in different types of environments of, of what those policy restrictions may very, help, may, may very well have been regarding especially online learning or these types of environments. And there's very strict protocols before this about how you can teach a lesson or how you can take a course or how you can be involved in things in New York State. Um, that's not the same way it is in the country, but that's part of the reality that we've been in. So I think the first pillar is we've seen this, 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 this evolution around that because the boundaries have been taken down deliberately and maybe that will continue to be able to drive some thinking around that. And the second part is um, our partners have been very generous sharing their screen time with many of our students as well. And as we're looking to the fall and we're looking to the future, how, what does hybrid really end up becoming more? What we're challenged with on the other side is in our real technical training application programs. Most students come into a lot of our programs because they enjoy working and doing with their hands. They enjoy the real problem solving and the work that comes with taking something apart and building it again in a different way. Tough to replicate on, uh, on a, in a virtual environment. So we're looking at hybrid approaches where you can get some hybrid work-based learning experiences from a virtual and being on site. And we're really focusing that from the classroom part where our classroom focus becomes really about the lab experience and we can translate as much of the related academic part online. So I think that is going to solve some of the some of the challenges we see coming, where we're maximizing time um, in the facilities, really working in the labs and doing that work that needs to get, get accomplished there, where you just can't have that immersive experience, and translating to what we can into the um, uh, the other environment, supporting the folks that are involved with that, and our, and our partners, um, um, again with their generosity to, to being very flexible and spending time with our students over uh, over this different medium. We see all of that kind of marching the same way as we do the work, the pipeline work, the skills and the certification work, and then ultimately the same thing with our employer experience. Uh, so everyone, uh, Lisa Milikovic has a really interesting, I think, follow-up question to what Joe was just talking about. Lisa, there is something slightly weird going on right now where there are three people named Lisa Milinkovic um, uh, in. So I'm going to set all three of you to be allowed to talk for a second. Um, Lisa, are, uh, are you there with us? You're going to have to hit the mute button and unmute yourself if you are. There you are. I just saw you unmute. Uh, would you mind asking your question to the panel? Uh, well, this is actually Eric. For some reason, you know, Lisa shared the link, which is why I think we're all Lisa. <laughs> and right. I didn't even realize it was logging me in as Lisa. That's a really good point, everyone. It's really important that you register yeah. yourself, not just register once and share the link. <laughs> so go I ahead. Mean, I mean, I'm flattered to be Lisa, so I'll go ahead and be Lisa. Um, Lisa is my boss, so, you know. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah, clearly. Uh, so my question was, um, we are being informed, uh, specifically in our district, we're a very large urban district, uh, that very likely when we return um, in the fall, we're going to be under some sort of blended uh, learning environment, uh, potentially alternating which students are present at schools, which ones are learning remotely, 
Uh, what that looks like, we have no idea yet, but that's something that's being developed. Uh, my question was, uh, in that system, uh, what does STEM education look like? You know, when we look at things like hands-on and exposure and opportunity, uh, as well as how do we ensure equity under that model? And what do large showcase, uh, STEM showcase events, which is something we kind of pride, you know, we're very proud of ourselves on and, and developed often. It was a big chunk of what I did. Uh, what do those events look like moving forward? Jill, you want to take a, an, an initial stab at that and then we'll uh, kind of continue out? Well, sure. I think uh, from my perspective on the higher education side, Eric, I, I just couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And I think that we're all kind of learning a new way of going about our business. Um, uh, just like you, um, our students, you know, the one thing that we have ahead of us is uncertainty. And we're all trying to lead the way in uncertainty while still giving reassurance that, you know, things can be uh, as normal as possible and opportunities for students are still there. So we just had our college graduations um, virtually, you know, and it wasn't the same, but we saw our college presidents literally going to students' homes to deliver their diploma um, in our communities. And so we really took an, a, a real local approach um, to that. But, you know, things like move-in day and student traditions and things like that for the future, I mean, our college students are giving us the same feedback that Eric just raised, raised about, you know, what does it look like going forward? Um, for, so for STEM programming, um, we're actually working with our partners now, Joe being one of them, uh, but to talk about virtual lab experiences, um, using engaging interactive platforms. Um, I think we've all gotten used to being remote, but one of the challenges that we have are related to, you know, just like room and, and you know, for uh, virtual experiences for our students, especially in high tech labs and, and other things that they won't be able to have access to in the future. So that's, that's really, really important. And we'll be looking for creative ideas ourselves on how to help to engage students and STEM disciplines going forward. Um, but also in the question of equity, that's been a real concern for us because, um, you know, students who were underserved before um, have even new and greater challenges with COVID. And so we really, have, with uh, COVID-19, so we really have to be, you know, really um, deliberate about help, trying to reach out to those students and, and help them make a difference. One thing that we have done was we have created new and partnerships with partners that we really hadn't worked with that closely before. I mean, we had, you know, engaged with them, but partners like the urban leagues in large urban areas, you know, to really try to engage these students um, and, and meet their discrete needs um, where before, you know, we hadn't necessarily tapped all of the leaders in these communities. Um, also, uh, nonprofit organizations, and I see several are on the call today, you couldn't be more important than you are at this time. Um, so helping to bridge connections and really try to support um, students of color and communities of color across the state and the nation. So that just has to be, you know, more important than ever. Um, but, you know, we're, we're learning as we're going, but things like, uh, you know, some priorities that we put in place are, you know, the mental and emotional health needs of students, um, student emergency funding, uh, things like technology training for students as well as for faculty and staff, and of course, um, broadens internet access. We have places in New York where, you know, it's very remote and um, they don't have the internet connectivity that other places do. And it's not even our most rural areas either. It's also some places in our suburban areas and um, urban areas too. So these are all challenges, but I think that I'm learning from partners about how to, how to um, really lead forward on them. Lisa, Joe, anything, Lisa? Yeah, I'll actually, I'll follow up. Maybe I'll, I'll approach it from a more practical manner. So I guess what I heard in, in your question, I think it was Eric, um, AKA Lisa, <laughs> was that, um, you know, things like, like, how do you engage a student? And, and um, when I sat down with a lot of my colleagues and we brainstormed this kind of stuff, we thought about, okay, well, you know, if I want to teach a kid how to run a PCR or a Western blot, you know, I'm really getting down to sort of the core science things now you know, can we set up webcams, you know, and, and, you know, like we set up the, an experiment with the, with the kids and then we actually run it, but we have a scientist that's in the lab because, you know, we have very, rem you know, few people that are actually on site at Regeneron at this point, but we're setting up webcams where they're actually f watching somebody do it. And of course, you know, nothing beats having to pipette yourself. Um, but, but <laughs> um, you know, things like that. Um, we're, we're thinking about, okay, you know, how do we get kids to think about science in a different way? You don't need to have hands-on science to learn science. How do you read a paper? You know, if you're, if you're talking about college level or high school students, there are many people who don't know how to read primary literature. Right, and so teaching people how to, even if they don't know the techniques, how to actually pick that paper apart 
and to figure out, you know, what are the, the shortcomings of those, um, whatever the, the methods were that they used, what are the shortcomings, did they overreach in their conclusions, that sort of thing. Even putting out things like, um, okay, you've got a, an outbreak of coronavirus, you know, and, and you need to solve some certain problem, all right, put them in teams and have them come up with ways to actually solve that. You know, that's thinking science. It does, it's not hands-on science. It's not the traditional thing that we're thinking about. But you can, you can do, you know, remote science conferences this way. Whether you're talking about, you know, an ISEF-affiliated fair or what have you, you can do a meta-analysis if you do it properly. You can um, take data that already exists on a server and analyze it. Um, so it, it's, you know, we just have to think outside the box. Um, you can do science and you can do rigorous science and you can do science well. You just have to think about different ways to do it and different ways to present it. Um, and then you have to deal with, you know, coming from this type of place, you know, making sure that a kid has a, a computer that works, that can get on the internet that, so that they can actually do this, so that they can, they can communicate with their colleagues and, and fellow students and that they can actually present it. So, you know, I think it's just taking and brainstorming outside of the box and, and thinking about how to integrate those sort of core principles of STEM um, into how you teach moving forward. Yes, um, I, 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 I'd like to follow, I think, with, I'm reading through these questions. There's some really interesting questions from, from the audience. And, and I'd like to, I think, follow with this question from Susan Pollock. Um, she says for Lisa, but frankly, I'd like to hear uh, from all three of you and starting with Joe. Um, Susan, are you there? Can you ask your question? I am here if you can hear me. Yeah, I think, I think mentorship programs are a big part of most ecosystems in one uh, form or another. Um, so I love your question. Would you go ahead and ask it? Um, so as we're dealing with trying to understand remote a little bit more, um, I would be really interested, Lisa, if you could articulate um, what gaps did you find that maybe we can address um, even better than we've had done before remotely um, for students in mentoring programs, but also in short-term shadows, um, opportunities for students to interact with career professionals, but maybe working on particular skills that may not have been the one that they would see in a shadow, or um, if you could share that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, I gave some examples in my, in my last answer, but one of the big things that we have noticed is that we're, we're for lack of a better word, throwing kids into a lab without the basic knowledge around, um, you know, the core principles of, say, molecular biology. Um, and so, you know, I think, and, and maybe I'm just old school, but uh, when I learned about PCR, it was, you know, putting a tube in, in uh, different water baths at different temperatures and, and understanding sort of what's happening to the DNA as you're actually running that polymerase chain reaction, right? The, the, the kids that are coming in understand that you heat it and you cool it and, and different things happen, but they don't really understand the core principles. And so because they're not understanding those core principles, they then cannot um, take, like I mentioned, primary literature, read through it and understand the shortcomings of that research because that, that's key to, to science is understanding, you know, where, like, why did you use that particular method or that particular um, way to measure things if you're doing, you know, some sort of immunofluorescence or something along those lines, and you're trying to see different um, cells that light up on a, on a cross section. Well, what are the shortcomings of that? And, and why would you use that over something else? Um, and so what we're focusing on in our mentorship program this summer, especially are things like that. So if it takes us all summer to go through one paper in a meaningful way, then that that's fine because these these kids in these science programs are like okay well you know we can't come on site we can't do science and and now the high school students are saying okay well i need to read a paper a day and and you know like what are you getting out of reading a paper a day are you discussing it are you figuring out you know where what the, the pluses and minuses of that particular approach was you know it's really getting down and understanding how to to focus on the details and you need some of the background information but then you also need you know a, a guidance on on the way to move move through those 
So that's what we're focusing on in sort of a broad level, high level overview on, on what we're doing with our, our high school mentorship students, which, you know, might be a little different from, from uh, secondary education students. But, you, know. you know, I think, um, at least for me, and this is just my opinion, but um, both in mentorship programs and in education, um, what I've been telling people to focus on, sounds like it's, it's kind of in line uh, with what you're, you're saying right now, I think, um, which is obviously there's going to be less content transfer um, in these types of scenarios than there is in eight hours of school. So we're trying to focus the most on making sure kids are safe and fed and comfortable, making sure relationships are maintained. And then when we're talking about academics, it's more about what are those transferable skills like we were talking about with STEM before, not what are all the things you can memorize, um, but what are the skills you use to learn things? What are the skills you use in multiple career paths and academic disciplines? Um, Joe, uh, what about the, the work that, that you're doing? Um, how has that needed to, to change in, in this way? And what have been the gaps um, that you've had to close? You know, I, I think this notion, I don't even want to say it, but I'm going to, and then I'll, then I'll move away from it really quick. You know, say it. Soft skills, of course, right? And I can see all the folks on the call and where they're from, but when we deal with our partners, you know, we have an employability profile and we go through these the different skills you know, the collaboration the critical thinking the, the 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 creativity communication those kinds of things where you hear from employers that they lack where they might have a might have a a, a student or work-based learning situation where somebody's very proficient at what they can and what they're part of um, but they don't have the other skills necessary to be successful in the workplace. So I think that stepping back and looking holistically at all the work, looking at our employability profile, doing the work that we do with our partners of what the expectations are and how uh, folks can successfully transition to the workplace is important. Um, and kind of related, today we, we, have a, we have 130 students graduating from our health careers program. Um, and today we have our virtual job fair. And we've never done a virtual job fair before, but these folks are all ready for employment. Um, so again, ironically enough, today we have 30 plus employers in the space virtually working with our 130 students, candidates, going through a job fair and having these conversations and having a different set of skills to be able to do the online interview, um, to be able to be able to communicate your skill set to be successful in a workplace um, and over these is something that just continues to grow. So this was certainly new ground for us to do a job fair of that scale um, for so many students online. Um, but it's just another point of where the where the continued growth can be seen, where innovation can occur around, and how we continue to work on those kinds of skills to to help the students better transfer into the workplace. Um, I don't know if this is going to, if, if any of you are going to have an answer to this, but I just want to ask it because it, it really follows on part of what Joe's saying. Um, Christine Spaulding's asking um, in the, in the Q&A um, that she has a robotics course in the middle school level. She's really worried about those soft skills because that's a big part of what they focus, the teamwork, the team building. And she's wondering if any of you have seen any solutions um, for continuing to work on team building when people are in remote, uh, remote areas. So whether that's software tools or, um, you know, skills, um, have any of you seen um, anything that, that's working? We're doing it now, aren't we? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, being, yeah. being able to actually have conversations in this way, you know, where you're sort of waiting your turn to give your opinion. You know, you can't, we can't all talk at the same time and have people talking over and, and you can really see when somebody's, you know, if you're, if you're working in a team, when somebody's sort of taking over, um, I think, I think it's different. Um, but I don't think it's any less valuable. Um, I think we just have to, to sort of understand that we're we're working in a different environment um but we're still losing using soft skills i mean my seven-year-old is on some application that she's you know doing her schoolwork on and you can leave chats right and 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 you know like she can either you know leave chats or leave little uh comments to her her uh, classmates that um that rise up or at least you know invigorate her classmates or she could leave comments that you know sort of bring them down so i think i think we should 
we shouldn't worry about how this is different, but we should focus on those soft skills that you're actually building. I think, you know, even moving forward, things are going to look different. And I, I don't think as a team, and I'm thinking about my own personal experience in, in science, that moving a clinical trial from start to, you know, actually starting in the clinic in eight days is unprecedented. And we did that without being on site. So that was huge teamwork. I, I think I think we just have to think that it's different. I don't think they're going to lose out on soft skills. That's, yeah. What Jill? I yeah, sure. I, I just, um, I was thinking about this and um, it's so interesting because for a long time I've been saying that this work is often done student by student by student. And I think that's really the value of the ecosystems because you know your individual students. Um, I just wanted to share an example. I was talking to a high school student last week and um, these high school students are aces with technology just to speak to what Lisa just said, you know, and, and to the extent that we can actually use that, um, because they're the ones who are teaching us how to, you know, build communities of practice and how to collaborate online and build team building skills. But um, the student that I was talking to, so he's frustrated because he can't go, he's a sports player, he can't go out and play uh, baseball, basketball. Um, he has no way really that, that he's sure of, of getting a summer job, which was, you know, income at the age of 16 or 17. So he's actually um, been online and working in, in um, entrepreneurial communities to start, it's so interesting, a sneaker restoration business, which I didn't even think was, you know, I, I just didn't think it was important, but I suppose if you're investing hundreds of dollars in Air Jordans or whatever the latest sneaker is, it, it does become important. But um, in his work, he's actually learned about acetone and different chemi chemicals, um, as well as paints that stick to leather and stuff like that that I, I had never thought about before. But I was like listening to him and I realized he has a little chemistry lab right in his home, you know, and now he's trying to say, OK, how can I take the skill of you know using art, using chemistry um, to restore these sneakers and then ultimately get them to market? So they're kind of they're kind of like finding their own ways of, you know, um, being being a teenager and, you know, also not even knowing that they're engaging in STEM, but, you know, figuring out, like, how to, how to drive their own learning experiences. And I think we can take advantage of that because I think, um, you know, that's something that's new, that, you know, yes, content's being delivered a lot of the day in school and students are attentive to that, but they're also trying to identify what their interests are and build on those interests um, in their own ways. So I think that's another thing. When you talk about robotics, I, I think something similar is true for many of the students that are engaging in robotics. So we all, I think, in this in this room, see the the importance of of STEM. Um, I keep saying, you know, we, we've been pushing science to the periphery for for thirty years in education in in America, and, and it's you know kind of finally apparent, um, broadly apparent, that that's not the right thing to be doing. Um, but STEM isn't the only thing that people are working about, are are, are thinking about, and worrying about. Um, Megan, can you ask your question? Um, yeah, well, one of the things that I'm noticing in my work with educators is that, um, you know, uh, they may not be as comfortable in STEM. Maybe they didn't receive that training um, in their lead up to teacher certification. And this is primarily for like K through fifth grade educators that are or early education. Um, and I feel like STEM maybe has a, a branding issue or something, because as you mentioned at the beginning of the um, conversation, we all do STEM all day, but I think there's a, a lack of comfort level on the educator um, side. And so I'm wondering what we can do about that aspect of it, um, maybe labeling things more uh, properly as, as STEM related or, or STEM activities. Maybe labeling is where we got into that, Megan. You know, I think um, I, I'm sort of thinking back to, so I have, I have two kids and two stepkids and, and I have a seven and, and 10 year old, 11 and 15 year old. And of course the 15 year old guy is sort of a lost cause. But when I'm thinking about my, <laughs> when I'm thinking about my kids, you know, we incorporate STEM everywhere. And, and I feel like when I start to label it, as it being STEM, that's when people tend to, like their eyes start to glaze over. You know, if we're just gonna go to the little brook that we have in the backyard, pick up a rock, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, here's a black fly larva, here's a caddis fly, and, and this is what they do when they build their, you know, I think, I think by labeling it and giving it like a bucket, we then sort of put too much 
emphasis on it. If we could just incorporate it more organically for a better lack of a better word, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And I, I feel like there's such pressure to integrate that now in, in all, all, all of the teachers that I interact with, there's such pressure to integrate that now in a meaningful way and give them most amount of information. But you know, kids are inherently curious. So you just so sometimes like, it's about finding um, what the kind of back doors are. And then later we could talk about, you know, yeah, the things exactly. that you are doing uh, were STEM. Exactly. So, um, like science and retrospect, right? Yeah, I can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe, you had something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I think, Megan, it might have been your question that was in the chat box, it was, it was especially in the, in the elementary or primary and intermediate grades, with so much to do. And I think the message is, this isn't another thing. There's a, you know, it's always another thing on your plate. It's not, this is the plate. This is the plate. STEM is the plate. Transdisciplinary learning is the plate. The approach to doing it is the plate. To this reframing perspective, I think is really, really important, and, and it is as you can it's, it is applicable to that level and the thing to be able to approach the work, whether it's literacy or otherwise, through this transdisciplinary integration lens is really the key. So, in the messaging part, I, part of that question earlier was how do you get to that, and I think this notion of it's not another thing, it's the it's not another thing. It's the way that you can do and interpret that work that I think just really puts fresh eyes on, on what could be possible, especially for the teachers in the elementary grades. Yeah, I think that that all makes sense. It's a lot of what what we've been talking about is um, is is what's the perspective and how do we make things applicable. Um, I'd like to close with a, I think a really interesting question. Um, from, I just lost my question thing, from Reginald. And I'd like to go to, to each of you with this. Um, what's the new message for parents and students regarding STEM, uh, STEM careers and job loss? With everything that's changed, with everything that's happened, what's the, what's the one or two sentence message that we should be getting out there? Um, Jill, you wanna kick us off? You are muted, Jill. Right. No, I know. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I know. That's like a new term. You're muted. Um, no, I was just, you know, it's really interesting because um, that's a really good question because I think, um, you know, parents in particular, as well as employers, it's, it's, it's really a new world. We were working with our colleagues at Civics Analytics and, you know, nearly half of parents of high school students today say that COVID-19 is forcing changes to plans for post-secondary education for their students. So it's really, it, you know, it is kind of like there's a lot of uncertainty for parents and there's a lot of uncertainty for employers, but I would say stay the course and focus on talent development, um, meet the students where they are. So if you're a parent and your student's interested in something um, and, you know, it, it's related to science, but they don't know it, just like we were saying, kind of backdoor science I saw um, in the chat box, um, really help them to stick with it and help them to develop their interest in this difficult time. And there's a lot of resources out there technologically, as well as all of us who, you know, on this panel today and, and everyone that's participating would be happy in a heartbeat to stop and, you know, see, provide resources, mentoring, guidance, et cetera. So I would just say stick with it and talent development at this time is really, really important. Joe? Our core message, it really, it really hasn't changed because we just focus on opportunity. So we're, we're constantly coming back to opportunity. And if anything, this has really continued to evolve the notion of, of opportunity. Um, it's, it's so, especially paramount to our region this huge breadth of what opportunity can look like for kids and making sure that they understand, well, I'm only STEM, that means I can only do this. And we have always been about that's not what that means. And I think that's important for everybody to again to consider almost go full, full circle here. What does STEM mean in terms of opportunity, in terms of, in terms of not just employability, but in terms of post-secondary, um, opportunities and in terms of what it means for in your community and connecting those pieces. So this notion, I think, of, of really pushing what opportunity can be across everything has grown, I think, even more so out of this because it's forcing people to really look to see where different opportunity lies. So there's this notion of innovating around the, the, the what that can be and how it can be and how it can take place. Um, and I think really, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, we're just going to continue to see opportunity grow. Jill, I'm sorry, Lisa. Sure. So I would I, I would agree with both Jill and Joe. Um, I would also suggest that 
it, this opportunity has on the flip side focused on how much we need it, how much we need scientists, how much we need science, how much we need engineering, how much we need those, those types of, of jobs to address these, these uh, different situations, whether it's manufacturing or, or whatever it might be, developing new therapies. So um, I, think, I think it's a teaching opportunity. And I think it's also an opportunity for people to understand and learn from you know, what's going on in the world and what are the different pieces that need to fit together in order for us to address this type of thing. So if anything, I think it should be a motivator um and and i'm hoping that it motivates you know the world as a whole to to, to move forward um, and address these types of things sorry my mute wasn't working thank you all i really appreciate it there's been um some really great ideas here and i can tell in the chat that it's uh what you've been saying has been resonating with everyone uh this has been a stem community conversation from stem at home brought to you by the stem learning ecosystems community of practice Thank you for joining us today as we discussed how ecosystems have been working to meet the changing demands of the STEM workforce pipeline. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Lisa. These community conversations will revolve around successful models and new ideas to support STEM learning experiences during and beyond this time of social distancing. Stay tuned to stemecosystems.org for upcoming shows, and please continue to participate. I'm Jeremy Shore, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.